Hey, Boker Tov, everybody. Uh, welcome, everybody, as we were schmoozing on uh, the weather when you got nothing else to talk about, and we have lots to talk about, so we have to talk about other things. Welcome. Part five, part five of six of this fascinating series on Miguelet Esther and all its readers. So we welcome back Dr. Aaron Kohler, and we look forward to this class. Vakasha. Thank you, Rabbi Kalman. Okay, yes, we are, so no news sources right now. <clears throat> I hope that we'll get through uh, the rest of the sources that were distributed last week. And then um, we will, I hope, move to another, our last topic for our series. Um, and if we get to that, I will be sharing slides on the screen um, for the rest of the class today. But I'll also, I'll also share my screen with the sources from last week right now. No, I can't, because the host disabled participant share screening, screen sharing. Oh, well. I know, no, no, I will do that. My apologies. We're talking oh, about okay. the weather too long. Okay, <laughs> I forgot to do my, all done. I, I, I'll be ready in a second if someone's, I can, uh, give me one second. There you go. All right, well, if you, if you, uh, thank you. If you're following along in your own copy of these sources, we're going to skip to uh, source number 10, which is on page four of the source sheet. Um, short, short source, wow. Short source from uh, another Midrashic collection. We talked a, lot, a little bit about those last week. Midrash Panim Acherot Bet. There's actually parallels to this in, in, the, in the Gemara and elsewhere. Um, but I, I want to think a little bit about uh, a couple of sources that uh, Chazal say, a couple of things that Chazal say about Esther that bring Esther in dialogue with the book of Daniel. So we have not spent that much time talking about Daniel. It came up a couple of times earlier on in our, in our time together. Um, but Daniel, we should recall two very important things to begin with. One, it's set uh, it's set over the course of a long time, but it's set in more or less the same uh, era and the same uh, setting as Esther. So it's also a Galut book. Uh, Daniel himself, according to Paragolith and Daniel, uh, was exiled from Yerushalayim, brought up in the, uh, in the palace, at least in the palace complex uh, in Bavel. And then over the course of the next six, seven prakim, uh, he winds up meeting and living with uh, all of the different kings uh, from the subsequent century. Um, so it's it, it's a uh, Eastern diaspora book. That's the first thing to remember. And the second thing to remember is that as opposed to Esther, it is an overtly from book. So Daniel uh, in Paragolif already refuses to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine. Daniel is constantly davening to Hashem. Daniel gets dreams. Daniel is a dream interpreter. Uh, Daniel is uh, not at all amb ambiguous about his loyalty to Torah, God, uh, the land of Israel. He davens in the direction of Yerushalayim. Um, so it's set in a similar time and place as Esther, but uh, at least on its surface, seems ideologically different. Okay, so that's the two things just to remember as we turn to these sources. So again, we're going to look at source number 10 here uh, from the Midrash. The Afal Pichain, the Midrash says about Esther, Lo Tama Klum, Ella Mishela, the Lo Mishul Chano Shal Melech, Keshem Shelo Taam Chananya Mishal, Vazaria Mipat Bag Hamelech Nibuchan Netzar. So, what did Esther eat in the palace? Midrash says, well, despite the lack of explicit mention anywhere in the Megillah of what Esther was eating, it is obvious that she did not eat the royal food in the palace. How do I know that? Well, the same way that Hanania, Mishal, and Azariah didn't eat the rations of the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that's explicit in Perak Aleph of Daniel. Now, in the Gemara, this actually raises a question. What did Esther eat? And there's a number of different possibilities raised in the Gemara. One is, now, Rabbi Yochanan says she ate zeroim, zeroim, uh, seeds. And he's not just making up a word. Zero im is the word used in Parak Aleph of Daniel for the vegan diet that Daniel and his friends insisted on in the palace of the king. So Rabbi Yochanan is in line with this midrash and insisting that Esther, of course, did not eat tray food in 
Ahasuerus's palace. Now, in the Gemara, there's other views. Shmuel says she ate uh, pig, she ate pork. Like, in other words, I don't know what she ate, but she ate whatever they served. Like, she, she was not making a big deal about her diet. After all, the whole, you know, major plot element in the Megillah is that she's not revealing her Jewish identity. So unlike Danielle, she can't say, well, I insist on <clears throat> a special diet. Uh, she has to eat whatever they serve, so as she doesn't, so, so as not to reveal her her secret. But um, but again, Rabbi Yochanan and this midrash say, no, no, no. There's no way that Esther is less from, less observant than Daniel. So whatever we read about Daniel Parakal, if we could just import into Megillah Esther, what did she eat? I don't know from the Megillah what she ate, but I know from Sefer Daniel what she ate. This is how good Jews act in the royal palace in exile. But other sources say like, well, actually, maybe the differences are the key. Maybe the difference between Esther and Daniel is really key to thinking about some of the broader differences between those books. So there's a really fascinating, maybe I should have given the whole context. Um, if anyone wants to open it, it's in the Gemara and Megillah, you'd bet Amud Aleph. And it's actually uh, a dialogue between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his students. And his students say, that's this very interesting question that, that uh, I don't know how often this question gets asked about Esther, but they ask, So Nehen Yisrael is a euphemism for the Jews themselves. So the question is, why, what did the Jews do to deserve to almost be massacred? In other words, let's not fixate on the fact that there's a happy ending. They almost got massacred. Let's at least dwell on that for a few minutes. What did they do to deserve to almost get massacred before there was a miraculous salvation? And there's some back and forth between Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his students. And eventually Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself answers, Torasha. What the Jews did wrong is that they participated in the banquet, in the feast of that wicked man. And that, of course, is Ahasuerus. So he's, he's noticing, first of all, something in Perak Aleph of Megillah Esther, which is that the Jews are not mentioned in Perak Aleph of Megillah Esther. Nothing about the Jews in the entire Perak, which parenthetically raises the question of why do we need Perak Aleph for? Like, why, why do we need to know this at all? Why don't you just start with Ahasuerus was looking for a queen? Like, what do I need to know about why he didn't have a queen? So I'll leave that for you to think about. But in Parak Aleph, one of the reasons that it seems uh, divorced from the rest of the narrative is that the Jews aren't even mentioned. So we picked up on some hints about the Beit HaMikdash and about other things, but nothing about the Jews. And Mishim Bar Yochai says, well, that's really important. That's not because the Jews are not involved in Parak Aleph. On the contrary, it's because the Jews are like everyone else in Parak Aleph. It's this you know, pan-Persian feast. Everyone's coming to party for 180 days and the nobles are there for seven days. And uh, this is all not the other way around. I'm sorry, the nobles are there for 180 days and then the people of Shushan are there for seven days. And uh, it's all very nice. And where are the Jews? They're also part of, of the uh, Persian empire. So, you know, whatever role everyone else is playing, they're playing also. And Shurim Bar Yochai says, well, that's a problem. That's a problem. The problem is that they're not doing what Daniel did. So Shem Bar Yochai seems to be contrasting the beginning of the book of Daniel with the beginning of the book of Esther. And he notices that the books both start with a focus on food offered by the palace to the Jews, but then they diverge. In the book of Daniel, Daniel and his friends, Hanani, Mishan, and Azariah say, we can't eat this food. We're, we're new here. We don't do this. We don't drink your wine. We don't eat your food. We need a special diet. But when I open Esther, I get the same opening setting. Hey, here we are in exile. The king is serving food. But where are the Jews? The Jews are doing what everyone else is doing. That's the issue. The issue is that they are not doing what they ought to be doing. So he's also reading the book of Esther in light of Daniel, but he's not reading it as I can use Daniel to tell me what Esther is doing. He's using it as, as a way of showing what the people in the Megillah of Esther are not doing. Daniel acted properly. He says, I can't eat the food. But I look in vain in Perak Aleph of Esther for any resistance to the royal food. They don't do it. They just apparently participate in the, in the party. Now, I, I want to 
think for a second about what this does interpretively, because what Rishon Bar Yochai is doing is not just ob observing that the stories diverge. He's really saying, look, this is the key to the rest of the story. Because remember, this, the question that he's answering is, why were the Jews uh, deserving or nearly deserving of uh, destruction? So I put this little chart there just to sort of step this through. So Daniel begins with food in the palace. And we hear right at the beginning, Daniel and his friends don't partake in the food. So in the rest of the book of Daniel, that explains why Daniel is constantly protected by God. God speaks to him. He has revelations. He understands dreams. Uh, when he needs a miracle, you know, let's say hypothetically Daniel were thrown into the lion's den or his friends, Hanani, Mishal, and Zariah are thrown into Kivshana Eish, into the furnace. No problem. God will step in with overt miracles and save the Jews because the Jews started the book by resisting the food of the palace and showing that even in exile, they were going to be loyal to their traditions. That's all in Daniel. Esther starts off, same challenge, immediately they fail. The palace offers food, the Jews don't resist, the Jews show up. Well, in that case, says God, I'm not gonna show up either. So I think what Rosh Bar Yochai is doing is not just observing that the stories diverge. He's really saying this divergence at the beginning of the stories, this question of what do you eat when the palace offers you food explains the trajectories of the entire story. So now, once the Jews do partake in exile, once they do enjoy that suda, well, the same way that they didn't show that they're loyal to their traditions, God's going to not show that he's loyal to his traditions. In other words, at this point, God's not going to show up and protect the Jews. So Esther needs a miracle. Too bad. You're going to have to work it out on your own. You're going to have to take your life in your hands. You're going to have to go into the king. You're going to have to orchestrate this on your own. God is not going to show up. And it's not because something about uh, exile or God. No, no. I know from Daniel. God can show up in exile, at least through angels. Uh, I, I'm, this is not, uh, it's not that God's uh, changed God's ways. The point is, Perak, Aleph, and Esther already set the stage for this because when the Jews fail to refuse that food, they set the stage for a uh, distancing between them and God. So this is all, I think, just unpacking what Rabbi Shimon Yochai is saying by saying, therefore they were so because they enjoyed the banquet, they deserve to be destroyed. In other words, because they didn't resist, they forfeited all rights, all claims on God's time and energy. You don't show up for God, God's not showing up for you. Now, we're going to move to a, a related issue, <coughs> sorry, um, which is uh, relevant for this year. Well, this, this text is relevant for this year, but the, the issue is relevant for every year. Um, the Mishnah, as, uh, as you recall, the Mishnah actually says that if there's a leap year, even if we celebrated Purim in Adar Aleph, and then they were Ma'aber the Shana, and the Beit said, oh, actually, there's going to be an Adar Bet, we do, we do uh, uh, Purim again in Adar Bet. Now, why? Why do we have to have Purim in Adar, Adar Sheni? Uh, so there's a couple of different uh, suggestions given in the Gemara, both in the Bavli and in the Yerushalmi. But I really just want to focus on one of them here. The Yerushalmi says, Amar Rabbi Chalbo, <clears throat> see this here, at the end of the source, Kedeli smoch geula li geula. Why do you have to have Purim and Adar Sheni? Because Purim has to be exactly one month before Pesach. Lismoch geula li geula. So notice that this is Rabbi Chalbo, um, uh, who's not the most prominent in Mora, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know, I feel like it's like, uh, you know, there's, there's no minor prophets. Uh, there's no minor Amorayim. So Rabbi Chalbo uh, is the one who says, Now, that sounds like a nice line. But of course, as soon as he says it, we start thinking like, wait a second, Purim and Pesach. So on the one hand, yes, these are both Gulot. On the other hand, they are so vastly different as Gulot go, right? I mean, how can you even compare the two? Not that one is necessarily better than the other, but one is clearly grander than the other. One has 
overt miracles. One has the Makot and Kriyat Yamsuf and Yitziat Mitzrayim, the Jews actually leave Egypt. And the other is, you know, Hester Panim, as Chazal told us last week, and um, uh, no miracles and actually no Yitziah at all, right? They, they don't go anywhere. So the Smoch Gula it sounds, it sounds good, but it also sounds intriguing. Like, you know, putting these two Gulot next to each other is not because Matzah uh, Minet Mino. It's not that they're, you know, oh, we have two things that are similar, they should be juxtaposed. On the contrary, as soon as you put them next to each other, the differences become really stark. Now, Rabbi Chalbo himself seems to have been really taken by this juxtaposition. Um, and Rabbi Chalbo, <clears throat> this is also Rabbi Chalbo, um, from, again, that Midrash, Midrash Panim wrote Bet. Rabbi Chalbo says, Bailayla hu nadadash nata melech, Amar Rabbi Chalbo, ba'arba'am komot ne'amar balayla hu. Ve'arba'atan hayu b'lilei p'sachim. There's four times that the, the Tanakh uses the phrase balayla hu, and each of them is the night of the 15th of Nisan. What are the four? Well, first, v'ayiba chatzia layla, z'ayal l'el pesach, so that one's kind of straightforward that it was tetva of Nisan, right? That's Yitzhak Mitzrayim. V'ayiba layla ha'hu v'ayitzei malach Hashem v'yach v'machanei ashur, uh, when uh, uh, Yerushalayim is saved from Sancherev's onslaught in 701 BCE, uh, that's Balayla Hu Oto Laila Lel Pesachaya. Rabbi Chavu tells us that was also Ted Bab Nisan. Vahi Balayla Hu Vayomer Elav Hashem. Oh, sorry. Kum Raid Bamachane Lel Pesach. Gidon story. And Vachat Bimei Mordechai. Akach Nemar Balayla Hu Nadadash Natamelech. So four Balayla, who's all four of them are Tetvav Nisan. Now, to be, to be honest, Rabbi Chavo is playing a little bit loose with facts here uh, in order to create this scheme. So one fact that he's playing loose with is the idea uh, that Balayla, who Nadadash Natamelech could be Tetvav Nisan. Uh, it can't really be Tetvav Nisan. They're just just in the chronology of the Megillah, it could be Ted Zion, it could be Yud Zion, it can't actually be Ted Vav. You remember that the 13th day of Nisan is when Haman sent out his decree. And then either that day, or let's just say that day to make it as compact as possible, uh, Esther says, go fast three days. So those three days have to be at least Yud Dalet, Ted Vav, Ted Zion. So it has to be at least the night after Ted Zion. So he's playing a little loose with the chronology here. He's sort of moving it up one day to get it onto the night of Pesach. Um, in a second, I'll say that it doesn't matter, but, um, but still, just notice that he's playing loose with the facts. The other fact that he plays a little bit uh, fast and loose with is the first one. So it's true that by Hiba Chatzia Laila, Zayal Lel Pesach is obviously Lel Tetvav. But remember his claim, his claim had been, I noticed that that first one doesn't have the phrase Balayla Hu. That's not actually a phrase that shows up in the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. So, uh, all right, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to him. Because, of course, what's important here is that the, the very fact that he's not really just observing things, he's actually constructing something here. And he's saying, okay, that counts as who And fine, it's not exactly Ted Vav, Ted Zion, but, but you see the point here, right? And the point is that he's seeing that all of these events, and I'm really just going to dwell on one and four right now, all these events need to be seen together. So the, the Leil Pesach and the Geula, remember he's the one who called it a Geula in the previous line in the Yerushalmi when he said, Kedeli Smoch Geula Le Geula, the Geula of Purim and the Geula of Pesach have to be seen together. Even to the point that he'll say that they both happened on Tetvav Nisan, even though that's sort of not, uh, not possible by the chronology of the, of the story. Now, what is he seeing though? Like, why does Purim have to take place on Pesach? So we already observed a few weeks ago that that's true, that that juxtaposition seems uh, beyond coincidence. In other words, the fact that Purim takes place on uh, Pesach does seem really significant. But what does Rabbi Chalbo think about that? That's harder to know. In other words, what does he think of, that tells us about Purim? What does he think that tells us about Pesach? What does he think about, tells us about the juxtaposition? I don't know. The fact that he thinks that, it's, that they all have to be on the same date and that uh, our, our, our sounds like he's saying these are equally great geulot. Like there are four great geulot in Jewish history. It's Yat Mitzrayim, 
Sancharev, Gidon, which is really not, has no claim to be here, but uh, it says Balei uh, and Purim. Uh, and those four uh, need to be in one category because they are the salvation of B'nai Israel. So he seems to be pressing hard on the idea that that uh, Purim and Pesach really do belong together because they're both times that B'nai Israel were saved. But not everyone in Chazal was so taken by it. A really famous line in the Gemara and Arachin, when the Gemara asks, remember the Gemara, this is the, in the Gemara, uh, there's a bright that says, is there 18 days that we say Hallel during the, during the year or 21 outside of the land of Israel? Um, and then the Gemara asks, why don't we say Hallel on Purim? And there are a number of different answers given. But Rava, what do we know about Rava? Where did Rava live? I don't even need a city. I just need a... Yeah, yeah in Bavel, exactly. So he's off in Galut, right? He's in Galut, in Bavel, Rava Amar, in the fourth century CE, right? So he's, he's uh, you know, 900 years, 800 years after uh, Miguel Adas there. Rava Amar, Bishlama Hatam, Halalu of De Hashem, Velo of De Paro. Hacha, Halalu of De Hashem, Velo of De Achashverosh, Akati of De De Achashverosh Anam. Says, no, we can't say hollow now. It just doesn't make any sense to say hollow here on Purim. Over there, with regard to Pesach, sure, we should say hollow on, on Pesach because they are now of De Hashem Velo of De Paro. They now are slaves to God and not slaves to Paro, which opens up its own question like, why is it obviously better to be slaves to Hashem and not slaves to Paro? But let's take that for granted. At least there's been a change in their in their situations, right? They're now of the Hashem, not of the Paro. But Hacha, but here in the story of Purim, Halalu of the Hashem, Velo of the Is it true that they're now of the Hashem and not of the Achashverosh? And Rav is pointing out that the end of the story of the Megillah is incredibly anticlimactic. Right? The Megillah ends with essentially nothing happening. So it's true that Mordechai is now the Mishnah Melech. That is true. And it's true that Esther, who has been queen for a long time, is now uh, a queen who's publicly Jewish. That's also true. But that's it. And as you know, everyone uh, who's read Tanakh knows, the limits of one person's political uh, um, influence can't outlast that person's lifetime. So since uh, a couple of people have mentioned already the fact that um, the Megillah has clearly based itself in some ways on the story of Yosef. I think pretty much every reader of the Megillah at the end of the Megillah is probably thinking, oh, wait a second, I know the sequel, right? Because I know what happens after the story of Yosef. And after the story of Yosef, we get Vayakko, Melech Hadash, Al Mitzrayim, Asher Lo Yodayat Yosef. So it's great that Mordechai and Esther are like powerful people. That's really nice to hear. But I know what the next line is going to be. The next line is going to be, This is not actually a happy ending. This is a temporary reprieve. But I mean, how could you summarize the, the end of the story? The end of the story is literally, the Jews didn't die. That's the only thing you can say. And they probably won't die for the next 10 years or so until Ahasuerus is no longer king. But that's, that's really all you can say. I mean, who's to say that in 10 years from now, uh, obviously, you know, no one at that time could have said this, but when Artach Shasta is the king, uh, that there won't be another guy, Haman, who uh, is Malshin, Kotev Sitna al Bnei Israel. And like then, I don't know, we're going to count on there being a, a closeted Jewish queen again? I mean, this seems like a, a bad template for Jewish survival in the exile. Like it worked once, but it's kind of all we can say. And that's what Rava says. Halalu of Hashem, Velo of I mean, has anything really happened here? Akati of We are still slaves of Achashverosh. Right? This is Rava, the fourth century Babylonian Amora, saying, I'm still here. Like nothing's happened. So I always read this as a as an angry response to Rabbi Chalba. Rabbi Chalba's like, you know, you gotta be so mech gula gula. It's really fantastic. Four things happened on Tetrav Nisa. And Rava's like, what are you talking about? Four things happened. Nothing happened. Obviously, it's better to not die than to die. But that's a really minimalistic version of what a geula is. I mean, we're still here. I'm still sitting here in Babylonia 
still avdeid Achashvirushanan. We are still slaves of Achashvirush. Now, you know, what does Rabbi Chalbo really would respond to that? It's a good question. One possibility is that he might say, no, but that's the point, Rava. You know, don't sell it short. In Galut, that is a geula. Like, maybe that's the point. Maybe, you know, give up your hopes for a Yitziat Mitzrayim redux, you know, a, a big new exo- exodus from Babylonia. That's not happening, man. We're stuck here. At least we can say Hallel, or at least we can, uh, he doesn't say Hallel, but at least we can celebrate the fact that we did have a, uh, a sleeper cell Jewish queen who was able to come out at just the right time and save the Jews. We did have a leader like Mordechai who was able to uh, mobilize them and, and uh, get the word to Esther. And you know, together they were able to save the Jews. Like, hey, that's not, that's not nothing. Uh, that is a geula that's worth celebrating. And maybe that's what Rabbi Chabal means. Yes, this is not like Pesach. It's, of course, a far cry from Pesach. But it's our generation's kind of Pesach. Like, we're not sitting in anticipation of there being Kriyat Yamsuf anytime soon. What we can celebrate is when things go remarkably well for the Jews. That's something to celebrate. So maybe that's Rabbi Chabal's answer. Rabbi's like, I don't understand what the point of celebrating is if, if we didn't have Kriyat Yamsuf. And Rabbi Chabal says, no, oh, the fact that Esther and Mordechai managed to save the Jews for this generation is a geula worth celebrating. Of course, I don't know what Rabbi Chalbo really thought, um, so I'm not going to speculate further. Um, maybe he read Purim very differently. But, um, but this, this anxiety about, like, well, what kind of miracle is this at all? I mean, you know, Rabbi's Akate Adedach Hashvirushanan, as opposed to Rabbi Chalbo's Kedele Smoch Geula Le Geula, uh, really do seem like some pretty profound questions about what we're celebrating, whether it's worth celebrating, uh, what we have in Purim. Um, okay, I'm just going to give you oh, a typo here, but uh, one, one last source here. So if, uh, maybe we'll come back to this if we have more time next week. I don't know, but I want to make sure that we get to some, uh, some of the other material <clears throat> this week and next week. So I'm just going to uh, give you one last voice in this discussion, and that's Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha. So there's a little mistake in the, in the English here, but um, this is back in the Gemara in, in the Bavli Megillah, Yudalat Amubet. There's a related text you see here in a different, a very different kind of text, the um, Skolion, which is a, a commentary on Megillah Ta'anid, also Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha. So you can look at that on your own, but just one, uh, one line from Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha in the, in the Gemara. Again, these are not actually set up as a dialogue in the sources, but I'm reading them as a dialogue. Because Rabbi Shuvan Korcha almost responds to Rava, um, which, again, he doesn't literally, but he almost responds to Rava thematically. So what do you mean? We, we absolutely need to uh, say Hallel. Uh, again, he's not literally saying to say Hallel, but they say Hallel on Purim. Uma me avdut l'cheruta minan shira, imita l'chayim lo koshakein? Rava, you say, you, you know, there's nothing to celebrate here because Akate Avdeda Hashviroshanan. But wait, it's even more important to celebrate. Look, it's great to celebrate slavery to freedom. Sure. Absolutely. And of course, we should say Shira on that. But from death to life, that's even more important. Now, I think there's a lot of Debre Torah and, and good ones about Pesach that say, you know, it's not enough to go from death to life. You know, there's got to be Matan Torah afterwards. There's got to be. Uh, something spiritually redemptive beyond just the Avdut uh, I'm sorry, beyond just the Mital Lechayim. Um, but Rishur Makrocha says, look, if you're going to celebrate going me Avdut Lecherut, how much more so do you celebrate going from a genocidal decree to life? Now, how long is that life gonna, gonna, going to be guaranteed? I don't know. I have no way of knowing. But at least right now we are alive. And that's certainly something to celebrate. So this is not really... Uh, um, it's not that, that he and Rava disagree about a certain fact, they disagree how to assess these facts. Right? Everyone understands that, that uh, Pesach was transformative in a cultural, spiritual, religious way and a political way in a way that Purim was not. Purim accomplished very little in the long run. And yet, so Rava says, okay, so then what are we celebrating? Rishul Vakarka says, what do you mean what are you celebrating? You're celebrating the fact that you're alive. That is really a big deal. If you're going to celebrate May of Dutle Chayrut, you absolutely have to celebrate Mimital Chayim or Kosher Of course, you're going to celebrate that. Um, so I'll 
again, maybe we'll maybe we'll uh, have a chance to circle back to some of these sources um, next week. And there's also one long source on the next page that I'm going to put aside for now. Um, so I'm going to stop this actually, um, and I'm going to at least uh, for the time being pause our discussion of Chazal's interpretation of Esther. Um, I'm going to take a couple of minutes. Uh, I'm going to open the chat and see what's there. And if anyone wants to ask any quick questions right now, that's great. But if they're not quick, then just put them in the chat and maybe we'll come to them uh, at the end. And then we'll switch to our second half today and uh, open a new, new topic about some of the modern readings. If you want, you, you can quickly go through the, the chat and then we'll leave yeah, any I'm just seeing anything I, 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 If yeah. I'll respond to anything, I'll read it out loud. But Yeah, 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 okay. Um, no, I mean, there's a lot of good good comments here, but since everyone can read them, I don't think there's anything I need to respond to. I think these are you know, great and, and good contributions to the discussion, uh, but I'll leave them for, there for everyone to, uh, uh, to think about. Okay, good. In that case, I'm going to switch gears now, put away our, our uh, Hazal hat for a little bit, not that they're ever far in the background. And, um, Give me a second. There we go. I'm going to share some slides. And here's, here's a map of what we're going to step through over the next uh, uh, today and then um, and next week. All right. So here's, here's my typology of modern readings. And you see they're not only modern. OK. And this is not all the readings that there are in modern interpreters. Uh, but here's, here's my, uh, my classification of modern readings. OK. So we've already seen a lot of this. So I think the big question that readers have to ask, and we've, uh, we've seen this, but now I want to put it as explicitly as possible, is, is Esther fundamentally different from much of the rest of Tanakh or not? So one possibility is, yes, Esther is not like the rest of Tanakh. Torah, Israel, God, all absent in this book. Big possibility B, no, no, Esther is really like the rest of Tanakh. Torah, Israel, God are central. Maybe in a different way, maybe Esther Panim, maybe something else, but, but they're absolutely cent central uh, to this book, no less than any other book. Now, if Esther is not like the rest of Tanakh, then I'm, again, this is a somewhat artificial, but uh, you know, I think it's uh, fair. Uh, then there's two further possibilities. Then one possibility is Esther has to be rejected. This is not a good book. We need a book that centers Torah, Israel, and God, and if Esther doesn't do that, then we have to reject Esther. Another possibility is we love books that don't center Torah, Israel, and God. We read the Bible and are super uncomfortable because there's miracles all the time and God's in charge. And like, this is not our world. And I, either because uh, I'm not sure God exists or because I don't see God in my world. Uh, and so I want a different kind of book. And Esther is exactly the kind of book that I need. This is fantastic. This is a book that allows for diaspora existence, without miracles. So this is the best, best book ever. Big possibility too. Esther is really like the rest of Tanakh. Torah is God are central. Then how do you make Esther read that way? Well, one possibility is just very heavy handed correction. You go in and you're like, oh, you missed it, right? So like the Greek version that we saw. Like, let me tell you about the dream that Mordechai had the night before this whole thing started. Let me tell you about the prayer that Esther offered before she went into Achashverosh. Or some of the Midrashim we saw. You know, how do, what did Esther eat in the palace? She ate a vegan diet. How do I know that from the book of Daniel? Um, so this is a, I don't mean heavy handed in a, in a bad way, but heavy handed in the way, in the sense that, you know, you don't see it in the book, I'll put it into the book. And then the last possibility is that Esther is like the rest of Tanakh, but how, how can that be if Esther seems so different? Ah, it's all satire. It's all satire. And that's something that we'll come to uh, hopefully today. Uh, that's a, that's a really sophisticated uh, approach. Uh, so I said sophisticated modern scientists, and we'll talk more about that when we, when we get to them. Okay, so I'm not going through all the different things that we've already seen. Um, so, but I'm gonna try to, we'll, we'll do a little bit of jumping back and forth, but, um, but as you see in, in most of my uh, parentheses here, uh, very few of these are new, right? So if, if you conclude that Esther is, is different from the rest of Tanakh and therefore must be rejected, well, that's probably what the people of Dead Sea Scrolls thought also. They were like, this is a bad book. Uh, I mean, this, this book has no God, this book has no Israel, this book has no Torah, 
So there's no Esther at Qumran. We saw this already um, for different reasons, political reasons rather than religious reasons. Uh, the same thing, you see this is Hotat Tivot Betar Poland, Warsha 1937. Um, so uh, in the 30s, uh, Betar Zionists are like, get rid of Purim. Like Purim is a bad holiday for us. Purim is a holiday that's all about diaspora. Uh, it doesn't have the land of Israel in it. So we're going to stop celebrating that. Right? Uh, that's a diaspora holiday. We're getting rid of that now. That's not for us anymore. It's not the kind of book we need. We need a book like Yoshua. We need a, a story like Tochai. Right? These are the stories that are resonant and relevant to our Judaism. Uh, a book like Esther, which celebrates, like as Rabbi Shua ben Korcha said, uh, surviving, like literally just surviving in exile. That's, that's great for diaspora Judaism. That's the Aduta Galutit. But now, now that we're Beitar Zionists, we don't celebrate this book anymore. So they advocate just not celebrating Purim anymore. It's not a holiday that's relevant. The second possibility I gave was that Esther is different and therefore this is a really important book. Like maybe I'm not so comfortable with a book like Yoshua that says that God's gonna help us with miracles uh, conquer the land of Israel. Like, maybe that's not where I am right now. I'm a diaspora Jew. I, uh, I live in exile. Maybe I live in the uh, United States of America or Canada. Maybe I live in Morocco. Uh, maybe I live in Persia. You know, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not looking for a story that's going to tell me how God's going to help me knock down the walls of a fortified city so I can take over the land. Like, that's not what I'm doing. That's not my Judaism. Also, God doesn't really show up that often in my, in my life. So I don't really know what to do with, with books like that. So maybe I look at Esther and I'm like, this is the book for us. So we have some pre-modern evidence that Galut Jews felt that way. So the first evidence comes from the city of Dura Europis, which you see here is uh, right you know, all the way, all the way in Eastern Syria. Uh, this has been for the last 10 years or so central ISIS territory. So unfortunately, uh, in the news too much. Uh, it's good for Dury Europas when it's not in the news. It's good for all of us when Dury Europas is not in the news. Um, but anyway, so Dury Europas is right, you see it's, it's right on the Euphrates. So here we have a satellite image of it. And I think what you can tell is that this is a really well-preserved ancient city. I mean, you see the, the outlines of it. It's built right up to the river. The river used to be literally, literally right next to it. Um, and so that was one major defensive side. And then here you see this mountain. So it was defended well on two sides naturally. So it's a very strategic city. There's lots of fascinating things to say about the Europas that I will not say now because I need to stay, stick to my topic. Um, so uh, here's a, a plan of the city, but I have a link here. Uh, Yale uh, excavated it back in the 1920s and 30s. So, um, they actually own uh, a good amount of the artifacts uh, that were excavated in Dura Europis back then. Um, the one part that's of direct relevance for our discussion right now is the synagogue, which you can see is right up against the uh, Western wall of the city here. And it is a amazingly well-preserved synagogue. And it's well-preserved because of the political history of the city which I'm promising not to talk about, so I'm not gonna talk about, but I have to say that uh, in defending the city, the people of the city actually covered up this entire row of buildings with dirt in order to make this not just a wall, but a massive fortification defending the Western side of the city um, from enemies who I won't talk about now. Um, so in doing so, they preserved the building in a way that virtually no ancient buildings are preserved. So this is actually the front wall of the synagogue, uh, preserved till the 1920s, because it was literally just covered with dirt 1800 years earlier, 1700 years earlier. Um, now, it's, uh, you know, it's a spectacular synagogue. It is in, right now, the Damascus Museum. One hopes it is still in the Damascus Museum. It has never been on display in the Damascus Museum, uh, because in the 1930s, Syria thought this would be great. We're going to have the uh, oldest preserved synagogue in the Damascus Museum, and Jews will flock to it and, you know, probably bow the wing, and it'll be a good fundraising opportunity. 
but by the uh, 1940s and 50s, that no longer made sense. So it's actually been allegedly in a closed off wing, not on the maps of the museum, but allegedly well preserved. So of course, today, everything is uh, even more tenuous. But anyway, this is the front wall of the of the Beit Knesset, the synagogue. So you see the uh, Aron for the, for the Torah, and you see these beautiful paintings that decorate all of the walls of the synagogue. Now, each one of these is, is uh, worth more uh, study, but just to the left of the Aron, I'm going to zoom in in a second, but just to the left here, right next to the Aron, is the Purim panel, the Esther panel. This is the story of Megillat Esther, just in the front of the shul, right next to the Aron. And the characters, you can't really see in this, uh, um, in this picture, even though the picture is quite good, um, some of the characters are actually labeled. So it actually says down here, um, Mordechai, and it says over here, Haman, and under this queen to the right is wearing like a halter top or something. Uh, it says Esther, uh, actually spelled with a tet, um, Aleph Samach Tet Yud Resh, um, which I think probably indicates that the artist or whoever wrote that knew the story of Esther, but had never read it in Hebrew. Um, they don't know it from the text. They know it because of the story of Esther. So there's a lot here that's uh, sort of interesting. You know, the choice of the scenes, the middle, the middle part here, these four people, it's unclear what exactly is happening there. There's messengers that, uh, unfortunately, no labels on that, that middle part. But um, the, the most important thing I just want to say for this morning is that, um, is that this is the scene chosen to be right at the front of the shul next to the Aron. So in this shul in Syria, when they're thinking, what should we decorate our shul with? They have the Aron. The Aron itself actually has three much smaller pictures of the Beit HaMikdash, which of course has been destroyed for 150 years already. Uh, I should say this is the early third century. I think I didn't say that, I'm sorry. Um, early third century, so it's destroyed in 243. So um, in the early 200s, so roughly contemporaneous with the Mishnah. So on the Aron, right next to the Aron, they put the story of Esther. And it's, of course, not verifiable, but it seems likely that one of the reasons they do this is because they do see, see this, as this as their story. Of all the stories in Tanakh, this is one of the stories that's most meaningful to them. They're living here off in you know, Bavel, broadly in the, in the Eastern diaspora. And of all the stories in Tanakh, this is one of them that's most meaningful to the Jews in Galut. So even without worrying about the details here, and there really, again, are a lot of interesting details, um, the very choice of the, of the scene to decorate the front of the shul with uh, may show that for diaspora Jews, this was a story that was particularly meaningful. The other evidence that this was a story that was always particularly meaningful to diaspora Jews uh, is the phenomenon of, of what in Hebrew is called a Purim Sheni, which is not the same as Pesach Sheni or of like Yom Tov Sheni Shal Galiot uh, of all the Chagim. Purim Sheni, which in English is usually called like a local Purim. And we have uh, evidence of, I think at least 30 um, local Purims that were celebrated in different communities around the world over the previous millennium or so. Um, and a lot of these communities, something happened to them. They were saved from something, uh, something political. They felt like they were in trouble. They were going to be in trouble with the ruler, with the king, maybe kicked out, maybe even worse. Uh, and then through some political machinations or uh, influence or just by coincidence, they were saved. And in these cases, in these dozens of cases that we know of, the community celebrated this by writing a Megillah and making what they called a local Purim, a Purim Mikomi. So we have a lot of these Megillot. I just put up, ran, like, it's fairly random, because it was the only uh, good visual uh, site I could find. The Columbia University Library happens to own four local Megillot. Um, you see the earliest one that uh, they have is from 1420 in, uh, let's say, Saragossa. Um, and uh, you see that the Saragossa community had a Megillah. This is a, a later copy of it. And um, there's a, a story that goes with it that they tell. Typically, the Megillot start, Vahibi May, someone or other, um, to link it with the, the Megillah. Uh, and the, on the right side of the slide here, this was just taken from the Hebrew Wikipedia page, um, the article Purim Sheni, 
which is a list. This is really um, actually from uh, Zunz, uh, Leopold Zunz's book on Tfilot that he wrote back in the uh, 1850s or so. He compiled a list of all the local Purims that he could find. And now it's you know, conveniently up on, on Wikipedia. Um, but here's the point that I want to dwell on for a second. We don't have any evidence of like a local Pesach uh, or a local Hanukkah or a local, I don't know, Yom Kippur. I'm not sure what that would mean. Uh, Purim is the holiday that lent itself to being localized. We're like, oh, we've experienced something like Purim. No one experienced anything like Pesach. Like, what would that mean? Right? I mean, like, conceivably, but in fact, no one did experience anything like Pesach. But Purim is a holiday that people identified with. Every time there was something that worked out really well, that a well-placed Jew managed to convince the king to you know, uh, uh, avert a decree, or um, a, uh, oh, a whole bunch of uh, different stories. But anytime that, that a, a community felt that they had been the beneficiary of an unexpected salvation that just seemed to work out better than you could have hoped for, that's a Purim. And that's, I think, really important, not only for thinking about all these other local Purims, which are really fascinating, and uh, no one's written like a book about them. So if anyone's looking for book topics, uh, you know, this, it's really, really fascinating. A lot of them we don't know that much about. We just have, let's say, a Megillah from a certain community, but we don't know what happened. We don't know the story. But in any event, um, so it's really imp important for these events, but it's also important for, because it tells us a lot about how they thought about the actual Purim. In other words, they thought about the actual Purim in a way different from like the way they thought about Pesach. Pesach is a one-time thing that hopefully we replicated when Mashiach comes, right? So it happened once, it'll happen again. That's Pesach. But Purim, they understood as something that could happen all the time because it's not something that's transformative in a way like Yitzhak Mitzrayim. This is not halalu of de Hashem, halalu of de paro, right? Like we used to be, but now we are. No, no, look, we, live, we still live in Saragossa. We still live in Morocco. We still live in Fez. We still live in Persia. We still, you know, nothing's really changed. But I'll tell you what's changed. It's true, akate avdei dachash viroshanan, right? So it's true, we're still, um, you know, uh, citizens of the, uh, or, or uh, subjects of the crown in Spain or Germany or wherever it may be. Um, but look, like, that's what Purim's about, right? We're going to celebrate the small victories. We're going to celebrate the fact that we did survive, that we managed to maneuver our way through the world. Again, it's a complicated world. It's really complicated when you're a minority Jewish population in a big, scary world ruled by other people who don't necessarily like the Jews. And Purim tells us that if you manage to survive that this, this generation, I call a kavod, you should celebrate. That is absolutely worth Yemea Purim Ha'ele. So that's the original Purim, and that then is a license for new Purims. So the, the key point is that uh, this is, I think, uh, good evidence for the fact that Jews in the last 1,500 years at least, but probably more than that, looked at Purim as a holiday that they could most identify with. Like, this is the holiday of their lives. This is the one that, like, I know this story. Like, this is a story that's of my life. It's not, if it's not mine, it's my grandparents, but, like, we all have a Purim story in our community. Like there's always some Haman waiting around the corner and there's always some story about Haman who lived not too long ago and not too far away. And the same way that Purim, the Megillat Aster, is the sort of archetypical story of survival in Galut. So we have our own stories of survival in Galut. And what this means is that the Megillat Aster was seen as different from other books. So this is not like Sefer Shmuel, right? We don't have a Jewish king. We don't have David Melech and the Beit HaMikdash. That's, that's not our life. But we do have a life like, me, the, like the life described in Megillat Esther. So this is a book that's different from other books, and it's our book. Of all of the books, this is the one that speaks most resonantly to us. Not Daniel. Because you know what I don't want to do? I don't want to go to the king and be like, look, I'm not doing anything to do. You know, even if you make rules, I'm going to flout them. And you know, if you throw me into the fiery furnace, so be it. No, 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 that's not a good recipe for survival in, in diaspora. We need people like Esther and Mordechai. We need people who know how to navigate this uh, treacherous, these treacherous waters of diaspora existence. And Megillat Esther is the book that speaks directly to diaspora existence. So those are, those are the uh, pre-modern people who look at it this way. Now, um, I said that uh, some of the, some modern people say, no, no, this book is actually like other books. Where do you see it? 
So I'm going a little bit out of order, um, but uh, Rabbi Kelman, I think the first week or so, you you said, oh, uh, Rabbi Liebtag sends a message. He doesn't read Esther the way I do. So I don't even know how I read Esther. I haven't, I haven't said a thing about how I read Esther. Uh, I'm only raising possibilities here, but let's say something about how Rabbi Liebtag re reads Esther. Rabbi Liebtag the way, he, reads he Esther. Did say, he did say, I think he listened to a couple of talks. He said, say, actually, you're not so far apart. And the, But anyways, we'll... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. All that means is that I'm a chameleon. <laughs> uh, um, but here's where Rabbi Liebzag writes about it. He says, no, the, the whole point of the Megillah is a satire. Yeah, it sounds like it's a diaspora-centric book with no God, no Israel. You know, uh, you know we, we live here in Shushan. That's the Bira. Trilet uh, and um, You know, all the important things are happening in Shushan. But that's a tragedy. And it's such a tragedy because it's really a satire. And it's not a sad book. It's a mocking book. Uh, so I took just uh, one phrase. He's written this uh, a number of different places. And I'm sure he's uh, spoken about it, maybe even in Toronto. But uh, in any event, uh, based on this historic and prophetic setting, one could suspect that the impending destruction of Am Yisrael by Haman may be a divine punishment for their apathy. Not so different from Mishra and Mayuchai. After all, the Jews living in the Persian Empire appear to have preferred Shushan over Yushalayim, opted to subjugate themselves to Achashverosh rather than respond to God's call to return to their land, and replace the Beit HaMikdash with the palace of Achashverosh. But for Rabbi Levitag, this is not a, a, a direct, overt criticism of uh, the Jews. It's a satirical criticism of the Jews. It tells a story that sounds like a great victory, it sounds like a gula. You know, Rabbi Chalbo got tricked into thinking it was a gula. It's not a gula, but it sounds like a gula to mock the Jews of Bavel who think that this is a gula. They think that it's like a big deal that uh, they've survived in Shushan. But actually, according to Rabbi Liebteg, the whole thing is a satire because what should they be doing? They should obviously be in the actual Israel, in the actual Beit HaMikdash, right? They have this choice. So they're opting to stay in Shushan. Well, in that case, you know, this is what you get. You get a degraded uh, second-rate gula. And, you know, I'm going to make fun of you for thinking that this is a, a great redemption. But uh, the real redemption, of course, would be in Yerushalayim with the Beit HaMikdash and so on. Um, uh, this has is, is been argued also by uh, uh, Professor Yonatan Grossman, Yoni Grossman, who maybe some of you know, also um, a really excellent lecturer as well, a professor at Bar Ilan. Uh, so he wrote a whole book called The Outer Narrative and the Hid 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 Hidden Reading. Um, and in his, so this is also taken from the uh, virtual Beit Midrash of uh, Shivat Haratzion. Uh, and again, he, 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 he uh, makes a similar move. He says, yeah, it sounds like this is set up as like an alternative to Yerushalayim, but actually the whole point is to mock the Jews of Shushan for thinking that they have an alternative to Yerushalayim. This is, this is a terrible condemnation. You see the last line, a condemnation of the Jews of Shushan luxuriating in the lavish royal feast rather than helping their brethren who had returned to their land. Now, uh, Professor Grossman also makes the point that, uh, that I, wanna, I wanna now make about this. There is absolutely no way to know whether this is right or not. I don't mean to say that as a criticism. I mean to say by the terms of the claim, it's impossible to know whether it's right. Because as Grossman writes at the end of his, uh, one of his, he wrote a 31 part shir, shir series on the VBM. Um, so he writes, can we be sure that irony is intended in the author's description of the massacre? No, he's quoting someone else here. Uh, literary study is not a murder trial. We cannot expect proof beyond the reasonable doubt, only a reasonable premise and sufficient textual evidence. And then Grossman says, this is extremely important for any literary reading, which may sometimes appear to project conventions that are not necessarily present onto the biblical narrative. However, it is doubly true when the reader argues for the presence of a systematic hidden writing throughout the story. So this is a problem, just a problem, that anyone who claimed that there's a satire here is gonna to have to grapple with. So the last, my last example here is actually someone, is he here today? Is uh, Seymour here? I don't know if he's here today. Um, anyway, Seymour Epstein, who's been with us uh, the last few weeks, I'm also here, in a recent yeah. book called The Esther Scroll, I'm here. Uh, comes to a, oh, there you are, Epi, uh, says, through a careful reading of the text, 
whatever, I'm skipping a little bit, sorry, Epi. Uh, it argues that the, uh, the author's conviction that Jews must not live outside the land of Israel, nor under any kingship but that of God. It is a tragic narrative with much hyperbole and some comic relief, not a tale of victory. Its two Jewish protagonists are highly assimilated and distant from Jewish values, not the perfect heroes we later made of them. So I don't want to pretend that, uh, that uh, Liebtag and Grossman and Epstein all say the same thing. They don't all say the same thing. What they do share though, is a sense that the surface meaning of the book is actually not a happy book the way it may appear to be. In fact, if you think so, then you're probably a gullus Jew also. You probably don't get it. But in fact, the book is a criticism of that perspective. So in the last, just for two minutes, I'm gonna dwell on the claim of satire and then I'm gonna wrap this up. We'll have to pick up next week. So I said it's impossible to verify. This is one of the big problems with satire. How do we know when something is satirical? It's really hard. You have to know a lot about the culture and the expectations of a book in order to know whether it's satire. And you know, all, all I put here are some examples recently of people getting tricked into thinking that things were, that, that actually were satirical were in fact sincere. So <laughs> this is a funny one from, uh, uh, you see it was already 20 years ago. Um, there was a article, let me see if I included it. Uh, yeah, there was an article in the, uh, uh, in the Onion, you see here, um, that argued that uh, Harry Potter books are sparking a rise in Satanism among children. Uh, so they, they, they uh, profile Ashley Daniels, a third grader, who uh, you see in the last paragraph, I used to believe in what they taught us at Sunday school, said Ashley, conjuring up an ancient spell to summon Cerebus, the three-headed hound of hell. But the Harry Potter book showed me that magic is real, something I can learn and use right now, and that the Bible is nothing but boring lies. I think it's great. Um, so this is obviously satire. This is literally in the onion, but uh, <laughs> but it was picked up by actual news sources, um, and there, there are all these news sources, uh, especially in the Christian right uh, papers, uh, saying that like Harry Potter books have to be banned. They are sparking a a rise in Satanism. Um, so this is actually from a fact checking website from Snopes, uh, which collects all the links of the the like real news sites that based on the Onion article, you know, wrote about this growing phenomenon of kids becoming Satanists uh, and stuff like this is actually just satire. My point is that satire can be lost on people. It's not easy to know when something's satirical or not. You really need to know enough about it. There was another, another example, I think things are just funny. Um, so there was uh, again, an Onion article, Planned Parenthood opens an $8 billion abortion plex. And um, Republican House Representative John Fleming of Louisiana uh, posted about this on his Facebook page. I had a terrible development this was, and this is why we have to defund Planned Parenthood. Uh, of course, it was satirical. The, the point is, and here's a serious slide that I won't read. The point is that there is no answer key to know whether something is satire or not. Uh, a, a satirical writer is counting on their audience getting it. But it's entirely possible that people won't get it. Uh, examples I gave are in the other direction, or someone who actually wrote satire and people still didn't get it. The point is that if satire is done well, it really sounds sincere. And the author is assuming and hoping that you'll catch on at some point. Maybe they'll throw in something, you know, so ridiculous or so over the top or something like that, that like, they'll be like, oh, I get it. He's making fun of this view. He's not actually espousing this view. So presumably when the onion put in that it was an $8 billion building called the abortion plex, they thought that was over the top enough that you would figure out this was satire. Also, it's in the onion, so uh, you're gonna figure that out. But, um, but some people don't get it anyway. So I mentioned this as a methodological problem, not as a criticism, but as a problem. In other words, it's entirely possible that Miguel Adestair is a satire. I don't know how we would know though. And so when I say that it's modern, sophisticated Zionists who read it as satire, I don't mean to belittle or marginalize the view. It may well be that it's only sophisticated Zionists who are sophisticated enough and Zionistic enough to get it. In other words, maybe the author was also a sophisticated Zionist. And he was also like, this is crazy. What are Jews doing here in Bavel and Shushan in the fifth century BCE when they should be in Yushalayim with the Beit HaMikdash? It's insane. Like, what are you doing? This is what life is like in, in Galut. But for the last 2000 years, we've all been Galut Jews. So we didn't get the satire. We're all like, oh, I guess it's a Galut story. And then with the rise of the state, and I'll go back to uh, Epi's uh, 
uh, slide just for a second, because he says this reading is a product of a postmodern perspective, one profoundly influenced by the existence of the state of Israel. Today, we're like, oh, we are also Zionists. Maybe now we get it. Maybe we do get what the author was doing. So maybe, maybe. But I want to point out that it's unverifiable. Like we, it's very hard to know what the author's perspective was. Uh, and so when Rabbi Kelman uh, suggested the title here, we got to stare at all his readers, uh, I want to put the emphasis on the readers here. Right? Because obviously we are bringing something to bear on the story when we ask the questions, when we open those interpretations. All right, I have to stop. So I'm going to stop. We have a lot more to unpack next week, but I'll uh, hopefully we'll pick that up next week. Okay. Sorry for already being over time. I'm just going to... Yeah, Rabbi Kalman. It's okay. No, you, if you want to take a, a couple of minutes and go through the chat box, it's perfectly fine. Okay, clear. if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're not so much, we're very mukbee to start on time. We're not as mukbee to end. Oh, okay. Up. Okay, good. Torah just overflows and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Michelle Chesner is giving a series. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very Please nice. not. Yes, yes, yes. See? Right. Okay. So uh, the only thing I'll, I'll um, yeah, so Epi made some good comments here about satire and also about the example of Miguel Hitler in, in Morocco. Um, thank you. The only thing I'll, uh, I'll just comment on very briefly is Zella's comment that Adele Berlin sees it as satire. Uh, so I'll just say that, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's a different satirical reading of the Megillah, especially the first parak, that's not satirical of the Jews, but it's satirical of the Persians. And that's what Berlin argues, that there's a satire here of the Persian, Persian ostentatiousness and the palace culture that for the Greeks, the I mean, Greek talking about like, from the Greek that, point of view. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, that the, uh, the Greeks would make fun of Persian palace culture. The Greeks are like, you know, we're all egalitarian. We don't bow down to each other. This is all crazy. Um, so there's a different satirical reading that some modern readers have offered that's not satirical of Jewish life in Persia, but a satirical of Persia itself. So yeah, absolutely satire, but in a different direction. Uh, okay, there's a lot more to unpack here, but I think actually that's uh, enough for today. So I'll leave it there and we'll continue. Seder, next week, Achron Achron Chaviv. Everybody welcome back uh, next week, next Tuesday, uh, Arab I guess, era of Purim in a sense. Uh, Wednesday night, of course, next Wednesday night is Purim. Uh, okay, we look forward to learning with you. And uh, in 27 minutes, Rachel Sharansky Danziger will be continuing her series, The Ins and Outs of Liberty, Sefer Shmuet. Today's topic is Freedom, Fear, and Time, uh, Sefer Shmuet, chapters 11 to 13, uh, The Death of the Firstborn. So that's uh, in 27 minutes right here on your Tim Torah in Motion Zoom channel. And then at 1 p.m., Rabbi Alex Israel from Alon Shvut. Uh, we're moving from the Galut to the Geula. We're for, to Yerushalayim, Alon Shvut. Maybe we should go Alon Shvut to Yerushalayim. I'm not sure. But anyways, that's the way it goes. At 1 p.m., Alex Israel will be continuing a series on Eliyahu, Prophet of Fire, that's at one. And then uh, we continue uh, tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, two o'clock. Uh, Mark Shapiro interviews Rabbi Ashkenazi from Madrid, Spain, as we continue our series on Jewish communities from around the world, places Torah Motion has visited in the past, and please God, we'll, we'll visit again in the future. And then uh, tomorrow night, of course, Dr. Sokolow's series, Thursday, Shuli Mishkin, continuing her series on archaeology. Uh, Parsha Shear this Thursday night, 8.30, Rabbi Shaul Robinson of Lincoln Square Synagogue, and then my Shear at 9 a.m. on the Sitter Friday morning, and then Rabbi Leaptag. 11.15 Sunday morning. So on Monday, uh, Jews in Islam with Dr. Rava Lindsay Guharts and then Mark Shapiro, 8.30, the rise of reform, the written response. I think I got in all the classes. Dr. Kohler, you want to join us? Let everybody know. And like I say, invite a friend. And that implies to our teachers too. They can invite friends to join us. And even if they're not such good friends, that's okay. <laughs> you know. So uh, we look forward to learning with you. We will keep the channel on we won't turn it off. So you can, you know, turn off your video, get a cup of coffee, and then come back at 11 o'clock. Okay, we'll see everybody soon. And please go out, Dr. Kohler, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye.